Well, we save more money on healthcare if we treat drugs like Netflix. Netflix subscribers surged, but its stock plummeted. Writer strikes in Hollywood and the actor strikes. Is the Netflix model even working for Netflix? Welcome to the Crossover Connections, the Jack Wayne podcast. My name is Jack. I'm a scientist and college professor based at an Australian university. And this podcast is around the latest headlines in science, tech, and productivity and how it informs the jobs of the future. Will the Netflix subscription model work for something like drug development in the healthcare sector. There's a couple of articles here that I've linked in the show notes that talk about drug pricing and the lessons we can learn for drug pricing from the Netflix model. And specifically, it is about hepatitis C and the hep C crisis. Hepatitis C involves drugs that have a very high price tag. Having a new payment strategy in place might help alleviate some of these costs. And you agree ahead of time, it doesn't matter how many patients need these drugs, we will pay you a fixed amount every month, every quarter, and whatever we need, we will get the drugs from you for that fixed cost. Some months it might be a little bit more than the amount, other months it might be a little bit less, but we both know the amount of money changing hands and it is a more known quantity. Just like for Netflix, some months you might watch a whole bunch of shows, other months you might not watch any shows, but every month you pay them the same fixed fee, about 10 to $20 a month, and that way they will have the money to keep making shows on the back end so that when you have time to come back to binge watch, you will have new things in your feed. It's a similar principle. If you do have a subscription model for healthcare and for drug company payments, treats more patients and the access of drug is not contingent on the cost for that quarter. Every quarter has the same amount of money going to the drug company and everyone has a more stable arrangement involved. There have been some follow-up studies about the efficacy of this model specifically for the treatment of hepatitis B and that's the next link in the show notes. They looked at the payer license agreement or PLA also known as the Netflix model for hepatitis C. The financial economic and healthcare outcomes. If you employ varying degrees of this kind of model where the government or the states give the company a fixed amount of money, guarantee that whatever drugs they need, they will get access to at that fixed cost. But the drug company gets that fee, knows it has a stable source of income, is not incentivized to push certain drugs because those drugs cost more money or these drugs are cheaper. It doesn't matter. It just however it makes it work on the drug company side, it knows it will get that fixed amount of income. And the conclusion of the study is that yes, the Netflix model, certainly at least in high income countries, will be able to improve patient outcomes with lower payer costs and more stable revenues for pharmaceutical manufacturers and that policymakers in healthcare should really consider this Netflix model. It is not a la carte, you're not paying for each show on Netflix as it comes in. You're giving them a lump sum, a fixed amount, a little lower than maybe you would like or a little higher than you would like, but at least it's stable. So the Netflix streamer knows it's got that amount of income coming in. So it knows how much to reinvest in new content. Both sides win. They get a stable income. You get a steady influx of product in the healthcare sector. That steady influx of product are drugs. And that steady income that's going to the big pharma companies is that fixed pricing that, again, should lower the costs for the patient, for the taxpayer, while giving the drug company stable revenue, stable income. Does that sound too good to be true? Well, the Netflix model is named after Netflix. So maybe let's take a second and look at how Netflix is going before we can come back and see if its model will work in a different sector. Is the Netflix model even working for Netflix? The headline reads from ABC News, Netflix subscribers surged, but its stock plummeted. Here's why. The stock has fallen roughly 20% since an earnings report that revealed its earnings were a little lower than they expected. So Netflix, by the way, is still very profitable. So they're not exactly begging for change around the corners. They still are working with billions of dollars. They added 5.9 million subscribers over three months ending in June 2023, which is a dramatic improvement. This time last year, Netflix lost a million subscribers, which is very concerning. And it boasts 232 million subscribers across the whole platform of Netflix. And it's far outpaced Disney Plus. Disney Plus has 158 million subscribers. So the amount of cash it has after it pays for all of its operating expenses grew by another $1.5 billion and it's got $5 billion worth of liquidity currently. So that's all really great. But why is it not so rosy? So it's revenue is a little lower than people expected. It made $8.2 billion 
which still increased from last year, raised 2.7% amount of revenue, but they expected 8.3 billion. So we're talking funny money at this point, like it's still really, really high, but I guess when you compare it in terms of big pharma, billions of dollars is not really that disproportionate to the realm that big pharma is operating on. So there are some interesting parallels here, but its stock dropped by 8% because subscriber number was no longer proportional to revenue. They were gaining subscribers, but they were gaining subscribers that were paying less money. Right now, we're in August 2023, Hollywood strikes that are happening. They're not paying actors, they're not paying writers, they're all on strike while they're trying to negotiate the impact of AI on their work. If a studio can just pay ChatGPT to edit some scripts, maybe he doesn't need to pay an editor to do that anymore. Maybe you work in virtual effects, VFX, and AI can do some version of that. They don't need to pay VFX artists as much anymore. Netflix is actually not impacted as much as other companies because they've got this amazing library of content that's been generated through all of those monthly subscription fees we've all been paying for the longest time as soon as Netflix entered our countries. So they've got an incredible surplus of content that doesn't need new actors and new writers to generate. It's already in their library. They're saving a lot of money by not having to pay these people, but it will catch up with them eventually because we are still paying the subscription fee with the notion that we're investing in the future content that we're not yet seen. Whenever we try and predict the future, the most destructive way of doing that is to look to the past. What has happened in Netflix, even as they are maintaining profitability, they started to cancel a whole bunch of shows that are very expensive. The link in the show notes is just in 2023, all the shows that have been canceled on Netflix or they're ending on Netflix. There's a lot of shows that are maybe your personal favorites or maybe one of your friend's favorites. They may be disappearing. It is not indefinitely going to be present on the platform. And at the same time, we're looking at shows that are very expensive to produce, maybe to offset the cost of these very expensive shows to produce that they know will get the viewers. They know have a built an audience. They need to cut or cancel or end prematurely all of these other shows that might be doing well, but might not be doing as well as they need to be. Some of these shows may include your favorites. Orange is the New Black, $4 million per episode. House of Cards, $4.5 million per episode. Bridgerton, $7 million per episode. By far the most expensive are The Crown, $13 million per episode. Probably just goes to the costume design. That show was amazingly shot and costumed. Number one on this list is Stranger Things, their biggest sci-fi hit, $30 million per episode. This is the high end of their budget items. And to be able to pay for that high end, they ax a lot of the low end, which we can use to predict what might happen in Big Pharma should they adopt this pricing structure. They get a fixed amount of money every single month or every single quarter, and perhaps to fund and finance their really expensive R&D endeavors, they might cut back on the other smaller, less consequential diseases that don't have as big of a patient base, and the people with diseases that aren't as common might suffer even more because the R&D efforts in those may not pay off as much as R&D in diseases like something like cancer or diseases like Alzheimer's with a much broader patient base and much broader commercial appeal for these companies. We don't need to rely on conjecture around the past. There is a very real example of the Netflix model in the UK with respect to healthcare that are showing there are some tensions rising. And I'm talking about the National Health Service in the UK with its medicine pricing scheme known as VPAS, VPAS. It's a voluntary scheme for pricing and access. And the claim from the press release released by the UK government is that VPAS, this voluntary scheme for branded medicines, pricing and access, delivers a value for money to the taxpayer and it saved £7 billion. What is this agreement? It is a five-year agreement between the UK government and the pharmaceutical industry based in the UK, which has a fixed cost for the amount of money the government is willing to pay these drug companies for all drugs every year. Anything over this amount, the drug companies will still make money on those drug sales. It's not a charity after all but they have to give a bit of that money back from the sale of those drugs to the government. There's a certain cap, everything up to this cap, we pay full price for. If you go beyond this cap and we need more drugs than this, the drug company still makes money, but we start getting a discount as the government and you have to start giving some of that money back. And this voluntary scheme for branded medicines pricing and access 
has a few benefits for the drug company as well. Given that they get a fixed income, like Netflix, they get a fixed income every year, reapportion that towards R&D in the way they see fit much more reliably. It's not an a la carte drug prescription process. But on top of that, the companies who enter into this voluntary pricing scheme, they will be in direct talks with health ministers involved in driving health policy. So there is that intangible indirect benefit of being involved in a governance side that will give these drug companies an incredible advantage when it comes to dictating the best way of investing their dollars. A world leading rollout of cystic fibrosis triple therapy in the UK, European patient access for a number of new drugs, negotiated new commercial treatments, all of these flow and effect. And again, from the government's perspective, they save the taxpayer a lot of money and has fast track cancer drugs to the right people and provided international leadership in the delivery of a subscription style payment model for antibiotics that incentivize developments and helps tackle antimicrobial resistance. All sounds great and a real boon for the Netflix model of drug therapies and paying in lump sum ahead of time to these companies. Anything above that initial payment pricing cutoff, the drug companies will still make money, but they just won't make as much money as they did. They have to give some of that money back. That's the spin from the UK government side. Is it universally adored on the pharmaceutical company side? The next article comes from the ABPI, which is the Association of the British Pharmaceutical Industry it is a company that represents a conglomerate of big pharma across UK. And this is the headline. The challenge, the current VPAS is undermining UK life science competitiveness. Disagreement between the government in the UK and these big pharma companies in the UK. Obviously, global pandemic, surge of all of these other diseases, infectious diseases, all of these surgeries that couldn't happen during COVID. Now people were getting access to hospitals again. And then the healthcare system started needing a lot more medication, a lot more drugs in 2021, 2022, and 2023, to the point where the repayment from Big Pharma back to the government rose from 563 million pounds to 3.3 billion pounds in 2023. I'll say that again, the amount of money Big Pharma had to pay back to the government for their lump sum not being enough to cover the additional overheads for the drugs that the government is asking for. The amount of money that the Big Pharma had to give back to the UK government was $3.3 billion in 2023. Just two years prior, it was $563 million. So it went up by $2 or $3 billion increase in costs for Big Pharma. Now, Big Pharma make a lot of money. They're a multi-billion dollar business, but having to give an extra $3.3 billion is not what they intended when they signed this agreement in 2019. And they're in the process of renegotiating this. That really shows the Netflix model of lump sum payments, subscribed, stable revenue. That doesn't account for all the fluctuations and cost and variability around how people do their business. And the variable here for the healthcare sector was there was a global pandemic and hospitals were closed or hospitals were overrun or certain diseases had a sudden spike that we didn't expect to have a spike before. And these medications that maybe were very expensive, we needed a lot more of those very quickly and Big Pharma, they can supply it, but that doesn't account for all of their running and operational costs. So the Netflix pricing model Model is more stable, but healthcare is not that stable. No business is that stable and will go into periods of instability and chaos. And that is where this subscription model might fall down. They might can this process in the UK before it even starts. And indeed, the pharma sector reels as the UK government doubles the payback rate on NHS. The payback rate from the government is a 26.5% payback rate. It is very, very high on branded medicines. It is doubled compared to 2022. Again, they pay back $3.3 billion to the government in 2023, whereas in 2021, they pay back $565 million. So that's an incredible increase in the amount of payback. This will not stand. Pharmaceutical companies in Britain and across the world will not allow this to take place unless they negotiate a much more lucrative standard payment. They will not be like Netflix and have lowered tiered models. They will have 
higher tiered models of payment. So how much money it really saves the taxpayer at the end of the day is a bit of a question mark. And on that note of contractual tensions and negotiations of pricing and the future of jobs, that brings us to our recurring segment, whose job is it anyway? A look at the latest headlines and how that informs the jobs of the future. One of the most famous subscription Netflix model payment plans for software is the Adobe Creative Cloud and the Adobe Creative Suite. If you're a photographer, a filmmaker, a graphic artist, an animator, you will be in the Adobe ecosystem in one way or another, whether you like it or not. Back in the day, you could pay a one-off fee at a couple of thousand bucks for Photoshop and you would use Photoshop for years and years until the next version of Photoshop is released. And Adobe very smartly moved to the Netflix model. They started charging monthly subscription fees, telling you as the photographer, as the artist, you will always have access to the latest and greatest software, but we will now ask you to pay a monthly fee as opposed to a one-off fee. And this article is from a photography aggregate news website, Petapixel. Adobe staff worry their AI could kill the jobs of their own customers. Some employees at Adobe are expressing concern that the company's advancements in artificial intelligence will kill the jobs of its current customer base. Adobe employees are expressing concern that moving forward with AI technologies will cause companies to downsize graphic design departments. And one senior designer at the company says it is already happening. Adobe, by embedding AI into their software, by taking money from people as a monthly fee, saying you need it for your job, we'll charge you monthly, you always have the latest tools. When their own tools are making their customer base redundant or less employable or less valuable, is that gonna ultimately affect its own bottom line? So Adobe's adoption of the Netflix model would mean that they will need that money to keep going. It's not like they've already sold a whole bunch of licenses for Photoshop and Lightroom and Illustrator that they can coast off those resources for a little while longer. No, they need that fresh set of monthly income. Everyone's subscription fee just on Netflix coming in so they can keep developing these features. But these features are actually outcompeting these people who are paying Adobe for their services, it's out competing them for their job. And if they don't have a job, there's no reason for them to pay for a subscription to Adobe. They will just stop any time and drop the ball. Adobe could very much be responsible for its own demise. But it's stuck between a rock and a hard place. If it doesn't adopt these AI features, it will fall behind very quickly and it will lose market share. So it has no choice but to embrace the revolution that AI has brought about. But this shows you another flaw for the Netflix model. The Netflix model only works if the value you are providing remains ever prevalent and ever relevant. If your customer base no longer has need of your services, then the Netflix model won't work. People who are on Netflix often cancel their subscription for months at a time and sign up again when they see a show that's interesting to them. Netflix is already under pressure from that pricing model. And I suspect to see any other service, whether it be software or healthcare, if it opts for this subscription-based model where there's a flat fee coming in, as soon as the climate changes, as soon as the variability appears in the demand of your service, that model is not quite so intact and everything is up for negotiations. It's time to revisit our old episodes in a segment called The Connect, where in particular we'll be focusing on comments from viewers, comes courtesy of a comment left on my video around back pain and the opioid dilemma around back pain in that administering opioids might not be a very objectively beneficial course of treatment. And it comes from a user, Phoenix Thunder Tarot 3738. So I don't know what the significance of Phoenix Thunder Tarot 3738 is, but thank you for commenting on the video and engaging with the video. I'm trying to find and foster a positive community on YouTube, but I thought I would spend some time to address maybe some negative and constructive criticism for the podcast. Phoenix Thunder Tarot 3738, no knowledge base nor experience. Laughing, crying emoji, grow up. No knowledge base nor experience. This is not a time for me to outline my credentials, but as I said, I am a scientist and a college professor who's worked in these areas for about 15 years. I haven't worked my entire life in these fields and I do look quite young. If you're watching the video portion of the podcast, the audio version, I don't know how old or young my voice sounds, but nevertheless, that's a fair bit of constructive criticism, I guess. I can always 
have more knowledge base. I can always have more experience. And I think in many ways, this type of comment is every scientist's greatest fear. All of us have some version of the imposter syndrome, thinking that we don't have as much experience in the things that we're researching as we should. And we just need one person in the crowd who really knows that we actually don't know anything to call us out. And our expertise is like a house of cards. It comes crumbling down. This is not my chance to call out this user, Phoenix Thunder Tarot 3738. I totally agree with you. I think I need more knowledge and I need more experience, but I don't think the answer is to not talk about complex scientific issues because science communication is a practice that requires repetition, requires iterative improvement to get right. The only way for me to acquire the experience and acquire the knowledge base around the areas and topics in science is to have reps in talking about them. If you're early or mid-career young scientist or someone who's trying to get into science communication or any kind of media creation online on these very specific professional topics, don't let a bit of negativity get you down. We can all concede that we could do with more experience and more knowledge, but the way to get that knowledge and get that experience is not to shy away from opportunities to talk about topics in public forum. When the stakes are higher, you learn that much more quickly, that much more intensely. And I want to actually thank the user Phoenix Tarot 3738 for taking the time to leave the comment. Even though it was a negative comment, I think it's very instructive for me. I will look for new opportunities to learn and gain more experience over time. When you think college professor, my image is not usually the one that usually comes up. So very often when I finish class and the next professor is scheduled to come into class and I've been yelled at by quite a few professors before because they think I'm getting in their way and using the lectern and the lecture theater when I shouldn't be there. I should be like scurrying away after the last class is finished and again, that could very easily be a self-defeating thing. Oh, why is everyone being nasty to me? Maybe I shouldn't be doing this. Maybe I don't belong. Maybe I should be shooed away, but I've leveraged it and flipped it as a professional learning exercise. After I finish class, I always take that extra step and introduce myself to the next professor who's entering the classroom about to give their class. And first of all, that signals I'm not an imposter. <laughs> I do have a reason of being here. I am also a fellow professor, but then that allows me to form an extra network, an extra connection. And I've formed a lot of professional connections just through that simple flipping and changing the mindset. Instead of thinking everyone is out to criticize you and accuse you of being an imposter, engage with more people, take these opportunities to form more connections. That's actually a more beneficial professional strategy. That brings us to the end of another episode of Crossover Connections with Jack Wayne. You can find the full episodes wherever you find your podcast, as well as the video episodes on my YouTube channel, Biolab Collective with Jack Wayne. My name is Jack. Hope to connect you again next time around.